Today, I want to take a look at two of the most important laws in electromagnetic induction, and that's the Faraday's law of electromagnetic induction, as well as the Lenz's law of electromagnetic induction. The former explains and allows us to calculate the magnitude of the electromagnetic induction or the EMF that's induced, and the latter will allow us to get the direction and also justifies why electromagnetic induction has to happen. But let's start with Faraday's law. Faraday's law of electromagnetic induction tells us that the magnitude of the induced EMF is proportional to the rate of change of magnetic flux, linkage. In other words, E, which denotes the magnitude of the induced EMF, is proportional to delta n times phi, and, you know, over delta t, this tells us it's the rate of change because it's with respect to time. This tells us it's n and phi. We know that phi is the number of magnetic flux that enters a wire. n is the number of coils, like turns in the coil. So if you don't have one single wire, but if you have a, a, a coil like this, you have to count how many turns you have. We have one here, two here, so we would get two times whatever your phi value is. And that's what it, it's telling us right here. And if you work in SI units, then the constant of proportionality is equal to one, which means you can just equate those two together. And this calculates the magnitude of EMF. If you want to calculate the direction of the EMF, you will have to look at lenses all, which I will explain later on in this video. So let's take a look at a question. On example one, it tells us that a straight wire of length 0.2 meters moves at a steady speed at 3.0 meters per second at right angles to a magnetic field of flux density 0.10 tesla. Use Faraday's law to determine the electromotive force induced across the ends of the wire. So first thing that we know is that Faraday's law right here is E equals to delta N phi over delta T. Second thing, we should probably draw this thing out. So when I draw it out, I see a straight wire and I'm gonna assume that this is 0 0.2 meters and it's, it's traveling in this direction at right angles to a magnetic field. So I'm gonna say that the magnetic field is going into the paper and you can see that motion like this will be 90 degrees to the magnetic field and the flux density is 0 0.10 T. So to make life much easier for myself, we know what n is. n equals 1 because there's no turns at all. It's just one wire. Secondly, I want to let delta t equals 1. I want to look at the difference that happens when it's moved for one second. And that makes things a lot easier because we know that this is moving at 3 meters per second. So in one second, it would have moved 3 meters. Let's say this is 3 meters, which is not proportional to the 0 0.2 meters at all. But let's just let that happen. Now, that means that the area that it moves across is 0 0.2 times 3 meters, which equals 0 0.6 meters squared. In this 0 0.6 meters squared, what is the magnetic flux? Well, we have the magnetic flux density here, so we know the magnetic flux is equal to the magnetic flux density times the area, which also gives us 0, 0.0. Six. So now we have all the variables that we need. So let's erase this once. And so our final calculation will tell us E equals to delta N phi over delta T. Delta T equals 1, N equals 1. So that is delta 1 times, and phi was, as we calculated, 0 0.06 over delta T, which is also equal to 1. And so that gives us 0 0.06 volts. That's the EMF, and that's also the SI unit. Uh, when you use the SI units to calculate the voltage, you get 1V. Let's take a look at the slightly more complicated example number two. This is what's happening over here, and it tells us, a surge coil of 2,500 turns and of an area 1.2 cm squared is placed between the poles of a magnet so that the magnetic flux passes perpendicularly to, through the coil. The flux density of the field is 0 0.50 tesla. The coil is pulled rapidly out of the field in a time of 0 0.10 seconds. What average EMF is induced across the ends of the coil? So first of all, we should start by writing down the equation, which is E is going to be equal to delta 
N phi divided by delta T. And we already know so many. We know delta T. Delta T is 0 0.1. We know what N is. N is 2,500. Now the only thing that we have to know is this. Now we know that when it's completely in there, the entire magnetic flux is present. And it's pulled out of the field, which means that the delta phi is at first it's at a maximum and then it decreases to zero so how much magnetic flux is passing through it at that instant when it's in the field is going to be delta phi as well if that makes sense and this is pretty easy to do so first of all we have 1.2 cm squared we just have to convert this to meter squared and then we have to times that by 0 0.5 because our phi is going to be equal to b a so that's going to be 0 0.5 times, and we know that 100 cm times 100 cm is 1 meter squared. So we know that this is, we have to times that by 10 to the power of negative 4. So that gives us 1.2 times 10 to the power of negative 4. And so if you do this, we get 6, uh, 0 0.6 times 10 to the power of negative 4, which gives us 6 times 10 to the power of negative 5. That's phi. And so if we can put this into the equation right here, we would get that E equals delta N phi over delta T. And that gives us 2500 times 6 times 10 to the power of negative 5. That's a lot. And then we also have 0 0.1 seconds. Put this in a calculator and you should get 1.5. V. So now that we're done with that, I want to take a look at Lenz's law. Faraday's law was used to calculate the mag magnitude of the induced electromotive force. Lenz's law can determine its direction and addition justify electromagnetic induction. Now I want to recap some of the previous rules that we already do. So the first one is the right hand rule. And this can be used in two ways, right? Take a look at your right hand and pretend that you are actually putting it around a pencil or a pen or something like that. You will have this sort of shape. Now, first of all, the thumb can be pointing towards the current and the other fingers can represent the direction of the magnetic field that is induced because of the current in the, co uh, in the wire. So for instance, if you had a wire over here and let's say the conventional current was in this direction, then if you do the right hand rule, you should get that the magnetic field that is induced will be in this direction, just like the hand. Another way that this can be used is in a solenoid. So we have a solenoid like this. It's a very complicated coil of wire. And then we can find out in which way the North Pole is. So if let's say the coil, the, the current, conventional current was going in this direction, and it was going in like that, and then at the back, it's, it's going down. So it's kind of in this sort of thing, if that makes sense. It's like that. According to the uh, right-hand rule, let's say your fingers should curve from the outside to the inside like that. And that gives us that the North Pole would be on this side, the South Pole would be on this side. So you just use the exact same rule for the applicable situation. Keeping that in mind, Let's picture this scenario. We have a magnet that has its own magnetic field, obviously, and it's moving towards a coil. And we are putting in the force. We're moving it. No resistance whatsoever in there. And so when that happens, you know that there would be a current that is induced in this magnetic field. But why does it happen? Well, let's say that there are two scenarios. You could either have an induced current in this direction, or you could also have an induced current in the opposite direction. You could have a current that flows like this. In a hypothetical scenario, let's say this happens. Try to kind of curve your fingers directly in that way and see what happens then. If you did this, then you should get that the North Pole is here and the South Pole is here. What about if you do this? If you did that, you would get that the North Pole is here and the South Pole is here. So we're going to focus on this scenario right now. If 
this was true, then the North Pole would be here and the South Pole would be here. Because this is the South Pole and this is the North Pole, they're going to attract each other. So it's going to increase the kinetic energy over here, which will also increase the current in here, which is increasing the electrical energy of the electrons. But that doesn't make sense. It's like you didn't even push the wire, uh, the, the magnet, into anything. This is just doing it by itself, which means that this energy is being created out of nothing. And that doesn't work with our current understanding of the principle of conservation of energy. It only makes sense if we make this the North Pole and this is the South Pole. In that case, these two poles will repel each other. And that means that you will have to actually push it in there with your own force. You're going to have to do work. And so the energy that is obtained by these electrons as the current is induced actually comes from the energy that you did in pushing the magnet against the opposing forces into that position. If the North Pole is here and the South Pole is here, try it with your own hand. The current should be flowing from here to here, outside to inside, like that. And that's kind of going to explain the, the solenoid or the coil situation. The same can be said for this situation right here. Let's say you have a magnet and it's, it's creating this sort of magnetic field. Let's say you took a current, uh, you, you took a wire and you pushed it down like that. Now, it can go two ways. You can either have a current that is induced in this direction or you could also have a current that is induced in this direction. Let's focus on this scenario first. Let's say that you moved your wire down and this was the induced current. Well, if this was the induced current, then what would be the force on the wire due to the current? You can t try to get that using your left hand rule. So using your left hand rule, you have that this is the current and this is the magnetic field. So if you put it all in that direction, what you would get is that you would get that the force that is exerted on the wire is going to be upwards. However, if the induced current was in this direction, you can use your Fleming's um, left hand rule again, you would get that the force acting on the wire is in this direction. Now, this scenario is wrong because if this force pushes the wire down, then you don't even have to do any work. The wire will just accelerate down itself, it will gain kinetic energy, and not only will it gain kinetic energy, the current will increase, that means the electrons will gain electric energy out of nowhere, and that just doesn't work. However, if it was this scenario, then the um, force exerted on the wire would be upwards. So in order to actually get it down, you have to do work against this force, and therefore you are putting in energy from your muscles into this and this system is eventually what creates the energy that the electrons gain as they flow so if the, the conventional current is this that means that electrons are flowing here and this is this energy is coming from your muscles actually or whatever you are doing that's not a hand but yeah whatever you're doing pushing it down so to summarize Lenz's law, any induced current or induced EMF will be established in a direction so as to produce effects which oppose the change that is producing it. And this supports the principle of conservation of energy. So I think that's about it when it comes to an explanation of what Lenz's law and Faraday's law is. I hope it was helpful and to check out other helpful videos about physics on the same level. Do go and take a look at the other playlists or the rest of the videos that were posted on my channel. Thank you for watching.